Okay. Okay. Great. So welcome everybody to another talk in our master's series. Today we have Matthias Niesner from the uh, Technical University of Munich. Uh, Matthias is one of the most active members of the graphics vision and deep learning community in in Europe and in the world, I would say. I met him in 2016, I think, and we've been seeing each other in conferences and, and, and different committees and stuff. And he will always have new ideas, new papers, new things to show. He's one of the leaders in this deep learning revolution in, in graphics and, and vision. So we're lucky to have him today and, and thank you, Matthias, for accepting the invitation. So a bit more officially, Matthias Niesner is a professor at the Technical University of Munich, as I said, where he leads the Visual Computing Lab. And before that, he was a visiting assistant professor at Stanford University. Professor Niesner's research lies at the intersection of computer vision, graphics, and machine learning, where he is particularly interested in cutting-edge techniques for 3D reconstruction, semantic 3D scene understanding, video editing, and AI-driven video synthesis. His work enjoys wide media coverage with many articles featured in mainstream media, such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Spiegel, MIT Tech Review, and many more. And his work was also, um, has appeared also on several uh, TV programs. For his work, he has received several awards. He is a Rudolf Mosbauer Fellow from 2017. He won the Google Faculty Award for Machine Perception also in 2017. The NVIDIA Professor Partnership Award 2018, as well as the prestigious ERC Starting Grant also in 2018. Last year, he received the Eurographics Young Researcher Award, honoring the best upcoming graphics researcher in Europe. In addition to his academic impact, Professor Nisner is a co-founder and director of the startup Synthesia. Uh, so again, thank you very much. It's an honor to have you here and all yours, Matthias. Yeah, thanks a lot, Diego, um, for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, I'm going to probably try to make this talk a little bit interactive. So I know this is very difficult in a, in a Zoom setting. But if, if anybody has some questions or comments, um, either feel free to post them in the Zoom chat or just feel free to interrupt me anytime, turn on your video and just ask if there's any questions or if anything is unclear, or you have any just random remarks. I'm also happy um, to not always talking to kind of a, a wall of, of muted people <laughs> with no video on right now. Um, but yeah, anyway, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about neural rendering and why I think it's pretty cool. And I think the first question is always, and um, this is a very, you know, very hot topic in a sense in, in various communities. I think the big question is, what is neural rendering actually? And if you're asking different people, they're going to give you a lot of different answers. And we actually had a state of the art report this year at Eurographics um, about various neural rendering techniques. And we actually had a, a lot of people involved in that um, star report. And the one question that took us the most time is to figure out what is neural rendering? How do we define it? And there's, as I said, there's a lot of different, different questions. Um, and in the end of the day, what we did is in a sense, we said, well, we just want to generate some images or videos, right? We want to go and take a neural network. Um, and we want to generate some, some, some images and, and videos out of these ones. And there's, of course, um, the question is, what's the input to the neural network, right? That's one thing I'm not explaining here right now. I'm just saying like, oh, there's any way of generating images and videos. So in a sense, this definition would include also GANs. Um, but I don't want to talk too much about GANs today. I want to more talk about the graphics aspects um, and actually think about what is the input to the neural network, what comes here on the, on the left-hand side um, yeah, to the input here, right? Um, so that brings me to the point, like, why do we even need neural rendering to do that? Like, why, why do we need that? Um, like people in graphics, and I'm a, I'm a graphics guy, right? I'm originally, I've been doing a lot of work in graphics um, before I got into computer vision or machine learning to begin with. Um, like even 10 years ago, I would say graphics was, like the, the rendering part at least was relatively explored. I wouldn't say it's solved, right? There's still a lot of questions and like special cases, but generally speaking, we know in graphics when we have a 3D model, we can render it using ray tracing, we can rasterize it, we can shade it, we have, a lot of ideas how material definition should look like. 
And all these kind of things we know pretty well in graphics, actually. So why do we need neural networks? Why do we need this kind of fuzzy learning part um, as part of our rendering pipeline? Why is it needed? And, and this is the thing what comes more up when you're looking at it from a computer vision perspective. Because in computer vision, you kind of have the opposite problem. So what you would love to do in computer vision, you would love to get a, a reconstruction um, from the 3D world, right? Um, this is an example of Kitty, right? It's a data set for self-driving cars where you got a LiDAR scanner um, that gets you a point cloud. Um, and this looks something like this here, right? And you know, a lot of, a lot of methods or, or people in computer vision, they look into how can we understand 3D environments like based on these like kind of captured 3D representations or captured images or whatever, right? Um, but the point is, if you're looking at it from like a, a, a capture standpoint, if you want to use this content for you know, sharing it, you want to kind of replace videos and images with some sort of 3D content, um, you'd love to look at it like this one here on the right. So the computer vision community, like when you reconstruct something, it looks like that, but in graphics, it more looks like that. And the big question is, how do we go from here to here, right? Um, and this like this reconstructing the world is, is a thing that people have been doing also in computer vision for quite a while. This is not an easy task, of course. Um, and we are, of course, also not the first ones trying to solve it. Um, in fact, there have been people in the last 50 years trying to solve that. And it turns out it's a quite challenging task. And, um, and this is kind of what I want to motivate with no rendering. It's basically, well, when, when this kind of stuff doesn't look good enough, maybe we can kind of learn how to make it look better. And that's the thing I want to, want to talk a little bit about. But first, I wanted to talk about some early efforts, actually, we have been doing in, in the reconstruction side, because I want to motivate the problem more why it is, in fact, so difficult to get good reconstruction. So um, when I actually started looking into these areas, this was just when the Kinect came out. And, um, so the Kinect came out you know, 2011. And, and like these depth sensors were super popular at the time. And I think they still are, actually. Um, they're in the iPhone, for instance, right now. We have LiDAR scanners on cars. Um, so, so depth sensors are a thing that made it, in a sense, the commodity. Um, not so much in research right now, but more from a product side. You've got a lot of these applications built in depth sensors. And I'm not going to argue why depth sensors are useful. There's going to be some question in, oh, does it make? Eventually, it's the question of how much, how much battery versus how much compute um, and how much space you have in a phone on a mobile device. But that's a separate argument. Um, but for 3D reconstruction, um, there's been a lot of cool works when the Kinect came out. And Kinect Fusion was one of them at the time. Um, and I think this was really cool, right? You could basically, in real time, get 3D reconstructions. Uh, and that's also one thing we've been working on. So here's an example of our voxel hashing method. Um, so we basically took 3D scanning in real time and tried to scale it up to make it possible to scan large environments. So we have this voxel-based data structure. It was kind of cool to kind of tweak how to make these kind of things very fast. So here we see the input RGPD stream, right? And here we see the respective reconstructions. Um, and yeah, we were super excited. This ran in real time. And we got reconstructions at the end that looked like these ones. Um, so yeah, it look, looks not too bad, right? Um, getting reasonable 3D geometry uh, from a consumer depth sensor. Um, we can also scale this up. Uh, here we have an example um, from Cambridge um, where we have a relatively large environment that's being scanned. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of nice. Um, we had to deal with a lot of problems at the time, like things like loop closure. So if you, this is actually an example of my office when I was still at Stanford. Um, here we started scanning from this direction here, then we moved around, right? And then you, know, you have these standard posing problems when you're running a frame-to-frame -frame ICP, you're eventually going to have these kind of issues. So what we did, we looked at how to fix these kind of things um, by looking at bundle adjustment. So we formulated a... Uh, uh, a reprotection error. And the key contribution here was we could, uh, we could basically optimize that in real time, um, which was kind of novel at the time. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about it as if this was like way in the past, but actually this is, our, this is three years ago. And, and three years right now, as you can imagine, in our current community is like an eternity. There have been a lot of things being developed in the last three years. Um, but uh, what's interesting about this is a lot of these um, works right now here, I actually, based on the data we're using for deep learning right now. For instance, we do a lot of 3D deep learning on this kind of data that we reconstructed with methods like this. So with the bundle fusion method, um, which, um, was basically we had this one in voxel hashing here, we had these kind of problems. Um, and with bundle fusion, we fixed the loop closure, right? So we had this globally consistent uh, reconstruction. Um, and as I said, this also runs in real time. So we had like kind of this cute demo. 
um, where here we um, have a iPad, right? On the iPad, we have a structure sensor. So we have the depth sensor on top of it. And um, this is me um, at Stanford at the time. And we were trying to do 3D scanning, right? And on the screen, you will see the screen. So it looks something like this here, right? So I'm going to start the scanner. Um, now the data is being streamed to the desktop. And on the desktop, the reconstruction happens in real time, right? Um, so here in the bottom, you see a top-down view of the reconstructed scene. And here you see a, a rendering from the current perspective of the reconstruction. Right? So you see here is the top-down view of the scene. It's a bit hard still to see, but you see that basically I'm going around the office here. Um, and eventually I'm coming back here, right? And, and now you, you will see how, how the global optimization basically kicks in. Now we have this loop closure thing, right? So the, the reconstruction fixes itself as this optimization um, commences. Um, yeah, you can see uh, you can get this nice interactive feedback. We can do relocalization. Um, yeah, and so on. And eventually, when you're running this, we're getting reconstructions like these ones. Um, this is a 3D model. If you're um, of a copier room, if you're zooming in here, you see, yeah, it looks, looks kind of nice, right? Um, and the reason why I'm mentioning it is, um, for instance, we build a lot of stuff on top of this. Um, a lot of people in deep learning don't know about this anymore. Um, but like the scanner data set and these kind of things, they build on this kind of data. And we try to make it as easy as possible and abstracted kind of all the stuff away and just gave like the results of the bundle fusion method is now the ground truth for poses and so on for, for this data set. Um, but the reason why I wanted to talk about it is it's not necessarily for the semantic understanding side why we, why we capture a lot of data like this. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about this, like why we need neural rendering, right? Why, um, why do we need to do anything with the 3D reconstructions? So here you see a, a top-down view of the office um, that we just previously seen in the scanning. Um, and you see it looks, looks decent, right? You see like here is the, the desks, right? Here are the monitors. Here you see a bunch of shelves, a whiteboard, chairs, and so on. Um, and these are typically images that we put in papers because you know they look pretty decent. Um, but if you're changing the viewpoint here, you see that a lot of the geometry is actually missing, right? So despite an interactive system that gives us real-time feedback, you will quickly quickly see that you're missing a bunch of the geometry. And it's very difficult actually to get all the geometry. And I had a lot of discussion with people. It's like, yeah, why don't you just scan the rest of it? And I was like, yeah, we try it, but it's very difficult to get all of it. And um, and because of that, we, we had this idea of we wanted to go ahead and use um, like data-driven priors to figure out the incomplete parts. So we worked a lot on um, using deep learning methods to figure out the missing geometries here. We had the scan complete in 2018 at CVPR, uh, where we're taking like a partial scan here's input, and we're trying to predict here um, yeah, the remaining pieces of the, of the geometry, right? And you also see this in a video here, right? And yeah, this is the input again. And then here we see the respective completion. Uh, we can also infer the semantics, which you should see in a second here. That's what you're seeing here. Uh, we do these two things at the same time, and we show that they help each other to a certain degree. Um, and this is roughly what you're getting with the standard neural network technique when you have supervised data um, to kind of improve your reconstruction. And if we push this even farther, this is a very recent paper at CVPR this year. Uh, where we do the self-supervised. Uh, so the geometry we're getting actually looks pretty decent, right? You see this is the couch here. Um, you see the table here. This is kind of the input scan, which is incomplete. Um, and we had kind of a new nice formulation of doing this only on, on real data um, by leveraging partial to less partial data and stuff like this. And um, so we have a couple of nice architecture choices here. We're using uh, sparse convolutions in a, in a generative model. And, and that gives us pretty good results. Um, but I don't want to get too much into the geometry here right now. The big challenge what we have here, it still doesn't look realistic, right? We're still missing the textures and we're still missing um, yeah, the, the whole material and lighting information. And we actually, and by we, I mean the whole computer vision and graphics community, we've tried to get better reconstructions for quite a while. And what I'm trying to say is even with amazing reconstruction systems like bundle fusion and so on, we are still not getting to a point where this data is kind of usable. It's great for researchers, but it's not so great for other people who want to use it in AR, VR applications, right? Um, so one of the questions is maybe after 30, 40 years in trying to get better reconstructions, 
maybe we can say, well, why don't we change the rendering and learn basically what we need to fix? And this is kind of the idea of neural rendering, right? So neural rendering now says, well, give me a reconstruction, maybe like this one, render it and try to make it look better. That's kind of the high level idea. And the early ideas of neural rendering um, are actually conditional GANs. I mean, again, we can debate what the original what the, what the original terminology of neural rendering is, but I think for me it was always like this conditional GAN set. So basically, um, like what the Pix to Pix paper did is when you have a uh, a sketch of an object, right? You have like a CNN, and the CNN just tries to yeah take the sketch and create a real image out of it, right? So and, and this is just taking an image as input and taking an image as output, and we're going to get a, a hopefully a better looking. Um, now, of course, we can do the same thing with our reconstructions, right? Um, we can say, oh, we're reconstructing this kind of stuff here. We have a conditional GAN. We're taking it as input. You know, choose your favorite architecture, choose your favorite GAN loss, maybe. Uh, and hopefully, we're getting something that looks nice. So as you can see, these, these two images are just, they don't belong together. I just arbitrarily put them there to make a point. Um, but the point is, right, you can learn how to fix the rendering in image space by taking a 2D conditional GAN. That's like the, the easiest way to do that. Now, if you've worked on, on GANs and, and neural networks for a while, you will notice this is not such an easy task to learn, right? Um, but if you're spending a lot of effort in it, and you know, the Pix to Pix paper, I think is an amazing paper. It's one of the state-of-the-art papers there. Um, it's a challenging task nonetheless, right? You're getting good results for an image basis, but if you're trying to do this on a scene level, like you're having like this interactive like fly through and do novel viewpoint synthesis, then you see that a conditional GAN setting is still quite challenging. So if we said we trained like picks to picks on novel viewpoint synthesis, so let's say we take an object um, and we want to give it a camera pose, and based on the camera pose, we want to generate a new viewpoint. Um, if you're doing this, you're going to get a result that look like these ones here. And this is a cube, right? It has a texture on it of some text. Um, and what we did is we rendered this synthetic model. We trained the pix to pix model from it. And then we, at test time, we fed in the, the test pose, right? And we generated these novel views. Um, and globally, the structure looks good. Like it knows how to generate that. But it, the text, locally speaking, doesn't look great, right? You are going to have like these local text issues here. And that, that's, of course, an issue, right? Um, and the one thing, what from a graphics perspective, which I find very unsatisfactory with this pix to pix pipeline at this point was, well, this is a 2D network um, that is basically a series of 2D convolutions. You have a bunch of relos in between and so on, but it's mainly it's 2D operators, right? You have 2D operators, and the challenge is we want to learn kind of a, a 3D viewpoint consistency. And that is a very difficult thing to learn with 2D convolutions. So, the question is, how can we fix that? I mean, of course, one thing is you just throw in more data and make the network bigger. Eventually, it might learn it. I mean, you can try that. It works, um, but it's, it's difficult. But maybe a better way to do that is to inherently encode three operations in the network. Uh, and this is something we've done in the D-Voxels work. Um, this was actually led by uh, Vincent Sitzmann in, this, in Gordon Metzstein's group. Um, and the idea here is you're going to have a source image. Uh, you're going to extract 2D features first, and then you're going to back project these features into 3D, and then you have a bunch of 3D convolutions, and then you're back projecting them back to 2D again. Um, and the idea is that in 3D, it's a lot easier to learn all the stuff you need for novel viewpoint synthesis because you don't have to learn the viewpoint invariants and the rotations um, using 2D operators. Right? You have you have explicitly a voxel grid here in 3D. The features live in 3D. Um, and, and that makes learning a lot easier. That, that's at least a claim what I'm making right now. And like things like rotations and translations, you can get directly from here, right? Um, because you know them, you know the camera alignments here. And, and yeah, so the idea here is basically this here is a, I think, 32 cube grid. It's a voxel grid. And every grid, we're going to have an n dimensional feature depending on the stage of the architecture. Um, I'm glancing over a few things that I'm ignoring here. This is a simplified pipeline because the re-rendering here would require the depth. So we have to estimate the depth, which we do with a, a softmax formulation, but that's not the main point that I want to make. The main point, what I'm going to make, I'm arguing that with the same architecture um, and the same amount of training data, sorry, with the same size of an architecture and the same amount of training data, 
this pipeline is a lot easier to learn than if you're just using 2D convolutions. Uh, and this is what you're getting here as output. Again, same num roughly same number of parameters and um, the exact same training data. Uh, you see that the, the voxel approach gets you pretty consistent novel viewpoints. Right? And it's not surprising because all the rotation stuff you don't have to learn. You just have to apply to the 3D grid. Um, and since it's all differentiable, you can train the whole thing still end to end, which is nice. Um, so I think this looks pretty good. And I think it's pretty impressive that, um, well, I mean, it's not I wouldn't say impressive. It's, it's, it's obvious in a sense that you can get a lot better deep learning results by um, replacing existing things where you know how they work, make them differentiable, and put them in a neural network. So if, if you are doing anything in imaging or so, that's a great idea to do research, by the way. You just take a network and put in some stuff you know how it works and make it differential. That, that's a good, a good recipe for making papers right now. Um, so if you're looking closely at it, um, this looks pretty good, except here on these creasing angles. So if I'm looking right now here, right? Look always here where my, where my laser pointer is, right? On this end of it, right here, right now. Um, and these angles, it looks still very washed out, right? It looks like it's like, like these swimming artifacts, right? And the reason why you're gonna get these swimming artifacts is, is actually very obvious um, because it's based on the voxel resolution. So the voxels in 3D have a finite resolution. In fact, I think we only use like 32 cube. Maybe you can go up to 64, 128, but eventually you're gonna run some resolution issues. Uh, and in a sense, it's pretty inefficient how, um, how to store that stuff, right? Because it's a, it's a grid and it grows cubically, so that's not efficient. So the question is, can we do this better with existing graphics methods? And, and that's something we've been working on um, last year, actually. Um, so, and this is inspired from, if you're talking about graphics, from deferred rendering. So what you do in deferred rendering, uh, you're taking a mesh, and from that mesh, you render it, you're creating a G buffer, and the G buffer is basically albedo, depth, normals, and lighting. Uh, and, and based on these ones, you're having this like stacked image, uh, stacked textures and image space, uh, and you're taking the deferred renderer that takes this information and, and then does the shading and the lighting computations, right? Uh, and this is what we want to leverage this pipeline here. And uh, now instead of taking like features on a voxel grid, we're going to store features on a texture, right? Um, and yeah, you might guess that we want to do a learnable deferred shading pipeline. Um, and we call these neural textures that we store now on top of the 3D mesh. So this is a, a sphere from a 3D reconstruction. You see that, that the actual RGB textures look pretty blurry. It's actually a globe um, with a world map on it, um, but it looks pretty blurry because our reconstruction wasn't very good. But then what we do is we compute a UV parameterization and we assign some texels to this UV parameterization. What we then do is we do basically deferred rendering. We projecting these features into 2D we having based on the UV map, we sample these texels, like different shading, right? Um, and now these are some abstract features, and we want to have a renderer. In this case, we just use a unit that turns these features back into an image. Um, and the idea is we're training this whole thing here end to end, saying we're getting gradients through the differential rendering process. Um, and what we want to do is for various output images here, we want to optimize both the rendering network parameters like how to do rendering, as well as location-specific neural texels. So these are, in this case, we're using, I think, 16-dimensional neural texels. So we have this abstract feature on a surface point on the mesh uh, that kind of encodes the local appearance, right? So that's the whole point of it. Like, rather than storing it explicitly, we want to go ahead and encode this on top of the surface. And now, we're training this whole thing here end to end, right? Again, this is like a differential projection step. It's very easy to figure that out. Um, and then what we do is, um, instead of doing deferred rendering, we're doing this deferred neural rendering. Okay? So these features are now learned features, and our renderer learns how to turn these features here into images. Um, so I think this is a pretty simple concept, um, but compared to the deep voxel approach that I've previously been talking about, the advantage here is, that we don't have to store these features in a cubic grid, but we store them on a texture only on the surface. And the advantage of that, it's just a quadratic growth of memory, whereas the, the cubic grid is a, a cubic growth of memory, right? That's a cubic grid. Um, OK, so basically, we can try this kind of stuff for a lot of applications. Um, we're trying it for novel viewpoint synthesis, for scene editing, but also for animation synthesis. 
So let's see how you know, a few point synthesis looks like. We do basically, the first thing what we do here is we reconstruct a coarse geometry. Uh, and then we apply the neural textual pipeline with a UV parameterization that we pre-computed. Uh, and we get results that look like these ones. So here's the UV map in our deferred uh, renderer, basically. Um, and here we have the re-renderings. And you see, it looks pretty good, right? It looks like almost like real images. And we can compare these to the ground truth images that we've taken at the same time. Again, these images are not part of the training. They are just part of the testing. Uh, and you see, they look actually pretty close, right? So it looks actually pretty decent. So in other words, these neural texels, they can actually encode the local appearance. And that's much better than you know, a standard RTD value because if the geometry was actually broken locally, which it is in fact, because that's a reconstruction, um, it wouldn't be able to replicate like the, the real like target image that we want. Right? So this is kind of this learnable rendering stage. And I think that's pretty cool. Uh, we can also try the same trick for scene editing. So here we're taking an input sequence of the statue. Uh, we're running a multi stereo reconstruction method to give us some geometry. Uh, and now what we do is we simply take this statue here in the middle, along with its neural pixels, copy paste it here and here. Right? So now we have three statues. And now we apply the neural rendering forward pass again in order to do the output rendering. Uh, and this looks like that. So here's the input and here's the output. Right? So you see, again, we have these two statues that we copy pasted and I think it looks actually pretty decent. There is one downside in this whole thing, what I just explained. Um, this is a forward renderer. It doesn't have any direction. So the shadow cast on the middle statue is only there for the middle statue, right? It's not part of the other ones. And of course, there would be natural extensions like, you know, replacing the forward renderer with a path tracer or something like this, with like neural path tracing, so to say. Uh, we haven't done that yet, um, but in a sense, that's an obvious thing that might be interesting to try out, right? Okay, uh, we can also do facial animation. This is one of our hobbies because we've done this a lot on other methods. Um, but I want to show you that this method actually works a lot better than before. Um, and the idea here is we have an uh, a video here of Obama. We're reconstructing the face model here. So this face mask, so three reconstructing it with conventional methods. We have a UV parameterization of this, of this face mask. Um, and now for the Obama sequence, we optimize the neural texels. And now what we can do at test time, we can reanimate this face mask based on a source video from Trump. Here, right? um, and based on that, we can actually synthesize new expressions. So we can have new facial animations that we artificially synthesize. Same, same idea, same forward rendering technique. The only thing now is we, instead of having a static mesh, we just have this animatable uh, face model. And again, this here on the right is the output and that's completely synthesized. And I can play it and you see like how this animation is basically transferred from here to here and how this target here is synthesized. And why? I, I would really say Clinton probably. I would have to say Clinton. And why? I, there was a little spirit. I, frankly, he would have been had he and why? I, I would really say Clinton, probably. I would have to say Clinton. And why? I, there was a little spirit. I, I, frankly, he would have been had he. OK, so we got another example here. I joined Google 15 years ago, and I've been privileged to serve as CEO for the past three years. OK, so we've done this basically right now here that we're taking the source actor, right? And we're using his expressions in order to, to, to animate the face here in the target. Um, one thing we thought is we can actually do arbitrary conditions here. We don't have to take another phase. We can also learn, for instance, to do this from audio. Uh, and this is one thing we've done um, actually this year at ECCV. Uh, so we have this neural voice puppetry paper that is using a similar neural rendering techniques than neural pixels, but we're conditioning it differently. So the idea here is we're taking audio as input and want to synthesize the video just based on the audio. Um, and so in this case, we have English audio. We took some, some newscaster from, from a German TV station, and then we want to transfer the audio to the mouth expressions here. But again, it's the same technique. We're basically using neural rendering here for the synthesis. The only thing we have to learn now how to map it to the audio or the other way around, right? That rain will gradually sink its way slowly southward into the far north of England, northwest Wales. Some clear skies, though developing in Scotland, temperatures overnight, 8 to 12 degrees Celsius. But for the bulk of England and Wales, clear skies, some patchy mist and fog, and temperatures staying at about 15 or 16 degrees. Okay. And the, the way this works is we have two parts of this, of this, um, of this model here. 
Uh, we have, let's start with the right hand side here. This is basically take a 3D face model, have a neural render, we use neural texels here as before. Um, and this one learns how to take this intermediate model and create a realistic output because we have the neural texels on top of this. But the new part here is right now we take the audio signal, the training deep speech, that's the state of the art um, feature extractor from audio signals. Uh, we're going to get extracted features um, from that. And now we are learning how to map this, these audio features um, to expression vectors. And these expression vectors, they are basically from a blend shape model. And we don't just map them to a generic phase model, but we actually learn, we have a couple of layers here that are person specifically trained, meaning that we learn specifically how would this one person say a specific phrase in a specific sentence. And by how to say it means, how do we have to animate the face such that the mimic this motion? Yeah, and um, yeah, so basically this first part here is generalizable. So we can, this one is trained across people. And this second part here is trained on a specific sequence. And if you're doing this again, we have another example here. Um, here we have audio input, um, Joshua Bangio, and here we have an, an environment video as output. Science makes progress by steps. Most of those steps are small, some are slightly bigger. Uh, seen from the outside, sometimes people have the impression that, oh, there's this big breakthrough, breakthrough, and journalists like to talk about breakthrough, 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 breakthrough. But actually, science is very, very progressive because we gradually understand better the world. So I think from a synthesis model, this looks actually pretty good. Um, and we can do a lot of cool stuff with it, of course. Um, but I don't want to go too much into, into more detail here. Um, I want to rather highlight a few weaknesses, what we haven't done yet. And one of the things when I started this talk was, well, what we want to do is we have some sort of 3D reconstruction that is not perfect, that is imperfect, actually. Um, and we want to use some neural renderer to make realistic images out of these ones again. And we're doing this by first doing the reconstruction independently and then training neural renderer given the reconstruction. But one thing that we don't do yet is we would ideally also like to improve the reconstruction based on gradients from a neural renderer, for instance, right? Based on some photometric re-rendering uh, re that we do with our, uh, yeah, with our uh, reprojections, we would like to update the geometry accordingly. Uh, and this is something that has appeared actually already this year. A lot of people have been working on it. Um, so this was this really cool paper from, from Berkeley, which is neural radiance fields. And in fact, they do exactly what I just said. They basically, they do neural rendering and they kind of update their scene representation based on the re-rendering. So they don't first do the reconstruction, but they still have a 3D representation, so to say. Um, and yeah, I think this is really cool. Um, I wanted to quickly explain how it works because um, we, also, um, yeah, we also have some follow-ups on this and we're working on this one. Um, so the core idea of nerves, uh, of neural radiance fields is that you basically think about a volumetric renderer. So what you do is you have an image, right? Uh, you shoot a ray for every pixel here, and you have a bunch of sample points along these rays, and the final color, what you're getting here in the image is the integral of all of these samples across the rays. And the same thing here for this ray here. Like for every pixel in every image, you're gonna have a ray, and you just integrate along the volumetric samples along the ray. And these are the radiances uh, you're integrating over. That's why it's a radiance field. Uh, so this is standard volumetric rendering. In graphics, people have been doing this for quite a while. Um, but now the, the key idea of NERF is that the output of the optimization is this radiance. So this F here is now this radiance field that they're optimizing for. Um, and in a sense, what they're trying to do right now is not just take one image and try to find the radiance field for this one image, but they're using multi-few constraints. So they're assuming you have now two images here, this one and that one. You have two rays here. These rays intersect. And in order to fulfill this color and that color, which um, uh, are seen now from different views, right? Uh, you're integrating here, you're integrating here, and you're getting this multi-view constraint similar to what you're getting in multi-view stereo methods, right? And the idea, of course, is the more images you're adding, the more over-constrained your problem gets, and you simply have to just solve this radiance field such that in the optimal way fulfills all these multi-view constraints. Um, so the losses basically just go over the integral over this ray here, uh, and then you compare it with the observed color. You do the same thing for the other ray here, right? And you do this across all images, and you do it across all rays. 
Um, so that's kind of the idea of null radiance field. So it sounds pretty easy um, because all you're doing is you're optimizing for this radiance field um, across all the constraints you have uh, given your images, right? And now you're gonna have another thing to, to, to solve is how do you represent this F here? Do you store this in a 3D grid, um, this radiance field, or how do you store all these samples along the arrays? And this is the second contribution they're making. Essentially what they're saying, instead of storing this F here into a grid, they're going ahead and storing F as an implicit function. And an implicit function is just a series of fully connected layers. So it's a bunch of MLPs. Um, and the idea is, this is just this function here gets a coordinate as input, x, y, and z. It's just the sample coordinates here, right? Uh, and it spits out an RGB value and a density, right? It tells you, like, ideally, you want to have a high density here on the surface and you want to have a low density everywhere else. Um, it also takes as input the, the view direction of the ray. Uh, and this one basically here is, a, is actually, it's a bit misleading. It's not actually fit here and the in, at the input, it's actually fit fed in later in the network. So it creates a bit of regularization. I don't want to go into too much detail again here, um, uh, how, how, the, how, how these angles here are fed in. But I think the high level idea is, is, is really cool, right? Because you just have the implicit function that gets x, y, z as input, predicts you RGB uh, at the current sample plus a radiance. And now what you're trying to do is you're trying to solve for this f function for these MLP weights, uh, given as many field multi field constraints as you have. So you get post input, uh, and you're going to get these. And this work, I'm sure probably all of you have seen it by now. It's a really awesome paper. I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm really excited about this work. Um, there's been already a lot of papers that follow up on it. There's even already a website called Neural Radiance Field Papers. Um, there's a GitHub page, and they, they're accumulating uh, papers uh, uh, that follow up on it. So there's already a few months old, but there's already a lot of follow up. Um, and one of the things, of course, the Neural Radiance Field paper doesn't do yet is it cannot handle dynamics. And this is one thing we've been working on in our work. Uh, we have looked at how can we do our null rendering for our face and body problem, basically. Well, not for bodies yet, but for heads, right? Um, so the idea is we have dynamic radiance field. And the question is, how do we, how do we make this nerve stuff, these like multi-view constraints, also work with, with dynamic sceneries? In this case here, we have a monocular input sequence. Uh, and of this input sequence, um, from an RGB camera, we first get the poses. Um, so uh, we know that. Um, we want to create this dynamic radiance field. And then the idea is we want to be able to do novel head post synthesis, and we wanted to do novel expression synthesis. So like in one way, we want to change the head uh, according to whatever input uh, we have. We want to also oh, a head post change here. Right. Um, and here we want to also change the expressions then. So we can basically. Uh, yeah, let make, make the person like talk. This is similar to what the neural textiles paper has been doing. And this one is kind of new in a sense, but you can also change the head post. And of course, the idea we want to combine these two things, right? Um, and then we get our kind of 4D facial avatar, right? So we can do both now novel pulse changes and novel expression changes, right? Uh, and I think that's pretty cool um, that, that we can do this all at the same time. Uh, we can then also. Uh, control it. And I think this is one of the novelties that we're introducing here, that we have now explicit control of how to do these novel post changes and how to do the novel expression changes. Uh, so we can do facial reenactment again, right? We have here a source video, we have here an animated avatar, Let me show another one here. Right. Um, so it provides a lot more flexibility in terms of the controllability of what NERF did before. We also have the dynamic aspect of NERF um, and um, yeah, in comparison to all the other things like uh, like the neural textures, uh, we can actually do the, the head rotations, right? Um, but yeah, I should, yeah, uh, I should, yeah, I could show another one. But actually, I need to still explain how it works. That one I still haven't done yet. Um, so what we're doing is we're building this on based on a 3D morphism model. So the first thing what we're doing is we're taking the input frames from the RGB, uh, RGB sequence. Um, we Reconstructing a morphological model, we're fitting this morphological model to the uh, to this target video here. Um, we getting poses, intrinsics, and expression vectors out of that. So expression vectors; these are seventy-six dimensional vectors uh, for every frame one uh, that encode the blend shape coefficients for the face animation. So if you've done faces, this is basically what it describes based on a PCA model. It describes the uh, uh, the animation and the variation of the geometry. Okay. 
Um, so let's have a look at these two first, at the poles and the intrinsics. Um, we feed, we're doing here a, a few ray sampling, similar to what Merck was doing. Um, this few ray sampling here, we're sampling these uh, samples on this radiance field. We're feeding this one into an MLP network, and we're predicting the density um, as well as the RGB values for every sample. We are integrating over them along the ray. Uh, and then we do the standard volumetric rendering. We differentiate through that and we're optimizing for that. Uh, and we're going to get the results that look like this one, right? Okay, so um, yeah, if we're doing this, um, we can get results like these ones, right? So see, it look, doesn't look perfect, especially the background is kind of messed up, uh, but the face doesn't look too bad. So in a sense, this is like what, what NERF would produce um, on our method right now, on our data right now, if you have dynamic data. So it doesn't completely break, but it, the background, for instance, fails, and we don't get any, any control over expressions. So the first thing we're doing is we're fixing the background. So we're feeding in a background image here, and we're just feeding these ones as constrained here to the, uh, to the volumetric renderer, um, and we're combining it with the results from the dynamic range. Right? And if you're doing this, um, we're getting results already like these ones. right? Um, and we can animate it now. Well, animated means we can change the head pose. Right? We cannot change yet the dynamics, and this is the next thing we're going to do. Now what we want to do is we want to look at the dynamics. So we're also feeding in here the expression vectors um, in, and yeah, we're feeding these ones here also into our dynamic radiance field network. Um, and then when we're combining this, we can now start changing and making the person smile, right? Okay. Um, and the reason why this works is you would argue, well, you're just feeding in another vector and it could just overfit to it. The idea why this works is because you're having a sequence as input to train, um, you're seeing similar expressions across different viewpoints. And that is similar to acting like a multi-view constraint. It's like a multi-expression constraint that we have here, right? Uh, and that makes the network to find an optimal solution or optimize it to find an optimal solution um, to generalize across the expressions. Um, so this one looks pretty good. Um, yeah, we can animate it now and we can change the viewpoints, right? We can do these two things. And so if you're looking at this, again, if this is the ground truth here, if you have no expression conditioning, we're just getting always the same animation. Uh, and if you're having with expressions, we first of all, it gets a whole lot sharper um, and we can also animate it, then, right? Okay, um, there's one thing which is a bit problematic still. And uh, one thing is basically we don't have any information yet about the animation on the torso, for instance, here, right? Like we only have animation information right now for the plan shape model for the face itself, but we don't have any information here for the background. Um, and the idea is we would like to learn what is actually what else is moving. And so what we do is for every frame, we are learning another latent code that represents the additional deformations for what we haven't encoded. And the way you do this is just a per frame encoder gives you latent code, right? Uh, and based on this latent code, you have another conditioning that tells you the rest of whatever is happening in this one. So we don't use this for reanimation, but we use it for the training and it helps us to have an additional conditioning for the radiance field network to make it, look, uh, to make it kind of encode the rest of the uh, dynamics. They have actually been um, a couple of follow-ups on the Nerf paper. They do a similar trick like this one, um, but they don't to just uh, get something for Nerf for the dynamic scenes, but they don't use it for, for like animation or so. Right? Okay, but if you're comparing this, we're getting here ground truth, no latent code and with latent code. And you can see, I mean, hopefully you can see this over Zoom too, that here at the bottom, it's very blurry actually. Right? especially in the dynamic regions of the torso. And here it gets a lot sharper. Uh, and if you're combining these, uh, yeah, you can see it here again. You can hear very, very blurry, right? And here it becomes a lot sharper. Right? So these expression vectors, they actually help a lot to get us better, uh, better results. Yeah. Okay, let's have a look at some results. Um, here we have a control pose. So we're changing the uh, rigid body pose, uh, the rigid head pose. And here we're doing the expressions, right? So you can change the head pose and you can change the expression. What's actually pretty cool, um, we also get the reconstruction of the null map here, which looks like this, right? 
Um, I think that's pretty nice. I mean, it's a bit noisy, but you see that you get even the details here on the glasses, which I think is pretty impressive. By the way, you're also getting the fuel dependent effects like Nerf did before, but now for dynamics. Um, you have another example of estimated normals. Um, I think it's pretty remarkable. Like even you look in the eyes here, you're getting like really cool uh, results on the normal estimates here, actually, right? Okay. Um, we have a comparison also to previous work here. Here we have a ground truth. Um, again, not used for training. This is just a control sequence. Uh, we're seeing ours here. We have the video portraits. This is a 2D conditional GAN that we've done before. Um, and here is first order motion methods. They also using a, a series of 2D, uh, 2D operators, right? Um, and now if you're looking already here at the static images, you see this one looks a lot sharper than this one here. Uh, and if you're animating it, you see, well, the hair or so like here, it breaks pretty, pretty quickly apart. The mouth is not so great. And compared to the ground truth here, we're getting actually pretty good results. Also, the reflections are pretty good. And whereas here, yeah, it's like, you see these traditional GAN artifacts here. And also, um, we see another sequence here. Uh, again, we can see that the baselines, they struggle quite a bit for the most part, um, because it's, it's a very difficult task in this case, right? We have another example here. I'm not sure how, how well you can see it, but here, like it, it really breaks, it, it uh, stretches the head and stuff like this in the hair. The hair is often not very well covered. First, I think we can get pretty good results now. Um, if you're looking at some, uh, some applications, we have here reenactment again. Now we can use a source actor, right, to drive a target actor. And same thing. Okay, so let me get back to the beginning. Um, why do you think it's so cool? Well, the one the reason why I'm really excited about this nerf direction is because they're combining both directions, right? They're basically doing reconstruction um, and the neural rendering both at the same time. And I think that's super exciting. So this, this model implicitly learns the reconstruction. And I think that's really cool now. And I think um, we can all expect to see more, more follow-up work on this. Um, and there's still a lot of stuff to be done, right? I mean, this is like working on one on, on the upper head or so, but it's not like on full scenes or so. We are far away from getting this. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. Um, and I think if you're talking about the digital 3D reconstruction case, like how do we get from like these standard things you see in computer vision to the cool things you see in computer graphics from a reconstruction perspective? I think we, we made already a lot of progress on it, but now is a really cool time um, yeah, to, to work on this and, and, and try to actually get it to work. Eventually we'll see a lot of startups around it, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's a cool area. Um, one of the big questions is also like, how much can the AI do? Um, here's an example of the neural texture techniques. Um, if you're having like here a box here as like completely broken geometry that is supposed to render a vase, right? So these two geometries are very different. You can ask a neural network here to fix some of this stuff, but still use the, the 3D conditioning in order to control the poses, right? Um, so this is a fundamental question. I mean, this is just one example here, um, but the question is, how much do we expect the reconstruction to get perfect versus how much do we expect to learn, possibly do image-based and so on? So I think that, yeah, that's something we have to still think about, right? And yeah, I mean, overall, we wanna go to, to holograms, right? We wanna create avatars, we wanna create virtual environments that are kind of in, indistinguishable from real ones. And I, I think it's a fantastic area. And yeah, I don't know, I hope, I hope many of you are also interested in the area, so I think um, it's, it's, it's pretty nice. Um, yeah, with that one, I'm actually more or less through my talk. Um, I would like to thank my group. And this is always the thing as a professor, right? I'm, I have the honor to talk about this, but actually these people did all the work here. Uh, I'm also happy for all the external collaborators we had here. Um, I guess I don't have an extra slide here. Like Michael Tolliver was involved in the, uh, in the dynamic gradient scale paper. Christian Theobald um, and Gordon Wettstein were involved in the other papers too. Um, Vincent Sitzmann and a couple of other people. But yeah, anyway, I think, um, anyway, it's not just my work, it's a lot of other people um, that did the work here. And um, yeah, I think if you have some time, I'm very happy uh, to have a bit of a discussion still. So thanks a lot. 
Well, thank you very much, Matias. Um, it was pretty amazing and fascinating to see that some of the worst examples that you were showing refer to papers from 2019. <laughs> so it's extremely fast moving field. Uh, so you guys, uh, both in YouTube or here in Zoom, you can ask questions as usual. I'm going to open with one that I'm sure you've been asked many times, but I still feel that I have to, um, <clears throat> which relates to, uh, has to do with image forensics. Um, I think eventually we'll get to a point where it would be impossible to determine whether or not the images are real or have been generated with a computer. Um, so what is your take on that? How far are we from that point? And is there a counter science trying to guess what, what you guys are doing with images, if you know what I'm saying, like the computer virus and, and antiviruses program? Thanks. Yeah, very, very cool question. Um, also, ethically, I think a very important question. I was actually two or no, three days ago, I gave a, a workshop together with um, uh, Luisa Rodoliva um, together at, at the, uh, the, the cutting edge um, media forensics uh, conference. And media forensics basically tries to figure out, well, can we find some patterns in all of the stuff we're generating here um, that is real or fake? Um, let me put it this way, maybe. Um, so first of all, we're trying to do that too. We have a couple of projects like Face Forensics. We're trying to uh, detect deepfakes images. We're trying to detect images we are creating. Um, and, and one thing we have seen that in order to detect it, you need to mostly detection means you train a neural network, you need to generate some data. So in a sense, like having that data available was a, a big enabler for us to detect these kind of things. Um, there is, however, much larger questions is what is real and what is fake? Um, so generally speaking, all the images we are taking with a digital camera are fake to some degree, because what you're doing is you're projecting a real world environment and, and into a 2D, 2D set of pixels, right? So there's a lot of image processing going on. Um, I mean, you know that, right? Like all the imaging methods that are now on every cell phone, they change, of course, um, they change, of course, the content to some degree. The question is always is a semantic question in the end, right? Like how much does it uh, how much does it alter the meaning? If I'm speeding up the frame rate of a of a video, is that a fake video then, right? Or is it something different? So in the end of the day, like if you if you're going further and further, this is a general question for computer graphics. Is well, computer graphics in a sense creates fake images because you know that's the job of computer graphics, right? We're doing it in movies and video games and if you're thinking about movies right now, we're pretty far already, like how much is actually synthetically generated. Actually, most parts of any movie is synthetically generated. It just creates a lot, it takes still a lot of effort to do it. Um, and what we're doing here is we're making this a lot easier. So of course there's some ethical considerations and we have to be very careful how we address that, right? Um, so yeah, I think it's a pretty important area to consider both at the same time. The forensics is very important, but I think we also have to be very, um, yeah, transparent in a sense that you say what is possible and what's not possible. I think it's rapidly evolving, as you said, but I think we're not quite there to do like full scale photorealistic reconstructions of like large environments yet. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, David has a question. David, you can unmute the mic. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Matthias, for your talk. I think that it's uh, really, uh, exciting topic and it's developing greatly in these recent times as you explained. I have two questions. One is about your dynamic nerve because you said that uh, you are not using the multi-view constraint because you use the facial expressions as kind of a multi-view constraint. Uh, my question is if adding multi-view constraint could improve the result or be um, complementary to the data you're using? So, sorry, maybe, maybe this was wrong what I said. So we, of course, we still have the multi-view constraints. Oh, because, okay. Because what you're doing is you're still rotating your head around, right? Okay. So, I mean, the camera is static in this case, so it's not moving, but um, by moving your head around, you still have, you see the head from multiple directions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but I... in addition to that, we also use kind of the multi-expression constraints um, mm -hmm. both. Like if you have seen the same expression on different viewpoints, 
um, you like the network knows that it should give you the same surface color, so to say, right? Okay, I think that my question was okay. uh, maybe more focused towards the direction of improving the back the background uh, dynamics or something like that. That was a problem. I don't know if uh, yeah, because when you are moving your face, you can acquire the multi view of the face, but maybe not of the background. Uh, yeah, so the background, we have one image for the background, right? That's what yeah, we're so... assuming. Um, mm -hmm. And then at, at the training time for the video, we just need like this kind of video, right? And that's it. OK, so you don't uh, focus on the background. Uh, when at the moment, we don't do anything with the background, really. Um, it is it is a big, like, I mean, we're just adding it as a constraint, right, to the renderer at the end. But the, yeah. the question is, it's still like if you want to do large three scenes, right, and you have like completely moving objects in there, how do you represent that one? So that one we don't address yet, we're not there yet. But I think what we can do at least very well is once we can track the face for the local parts, for the expressions and so on, we have a good representation now. Um, but I think one of the big things is, right, like how to scale this up to large scenes. Okay, thank you. And my other question, I think that you mentioned something answering the uh, Diego's question. But how do you think that neural rendering is probably is or will affect the cinema or video game industry in terms of ideally not even have to record some scenes with real actors, but using previously previous models? I think <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I mean, the predecessors of neural rendering, like using CG to replace faces from actors, that's not a new thing, right? Um, so people have been doing this already to some degree. Um, most of the time, it's the other way around, right? Most of the time, it's they record the faces of the actors, and then they're copy-pasting kind of the actors' faces into some synthetic environment. That's for most of the part what they're doing. And then they have, like, at the moment, they have very expensive motion capture setups, um, you know, to, to track the faces. Like, I don't know if you, I mean, I don't know. I'm a big fan of a lot of the rings, right? If you see just the motion capture setups they had for Gollum and so on. I mean, this kind of stuff they're using to capture the motion, and then they want to animate all the stuff, right? Um, but neural rendering will eventually make this kind of stuff a lot cheaper. So basically, um, instead of probably doing this in a Hollywood studio, you can customize your movie, right? You can put yourself in your own movie. You can put your kids in your movie, and they kind of are part of the movie now. And I think that's pretty cool. That's very exciting, right? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Julio, you're monitoring the YouTube side of the talk, so if there are any questions there. Uh, there's one from Juan Raul Padron. Uh, he says, what do you think are the current challenges of neuron rendering given the exciting program advances such as NERF and extensions? So it's a question of what comes next or? Yeah, like what, what are the, the, the challenges with the recent advances of NERF? So, I mean, one challenge of course is how to scale it up, right? Like NERF currently also shows only results in a single in, uh, single object, but like doing this on large scale scenes, like let's say scan and reconstructions of whole rooms, like what I what I shown before you, like the, the reconstruction of King's College in Cambridge. So like these kind of locations, I think, getting like whole building photorealistic reconstructions is very hard. Um, another channel issue is the, the performance, right? Rendering is extremely slow right now. Um, all the training is relatively slow. Um, but generally speaking, of course, like making this more efficient and making it more viable to, let's say, real-time graphics pipelines like video games, um, I think that would be super cool from a graphics perspective, right? And we're not quite there yet. Um, another question could be, well, maybe for the actual application, we still want to extract some meshes out of it at the end of the day. Can we still do that? Can we then get the right textures and so on? Um, so I think that part is still missing right now. Um, there have been also a few early works um, that appeared literally, I think, yesterday. <laughs> Um, that, that focuses on lighting and materials. So lighting and material control would be also cool, right? If you could figure out how to, how to do these kind of things. Thank you. <clears throat> any, any more questions? I think Adrian, you? Yeah, so yeah. thanks, Matthias. The talk was fantastic and, and the work is super great. So congratulations on that. So I am a rendering, pure rendering guy, so I, I I'm kind of worried of losing my job here, <laughs> but uh, what do you think that probably is not something that's gonna happen in the next few years? Well, you never know because of the speed of this. But how do you, are your feels of, you know, maybe not having a few neural render 
uh, working for everything, but combining it with a traditional renderer. So I don't know, making some com very complex appearances more more close to reality by just plugging them with a neural network and making them making the neural network do its magic instead of you know computing all the you know interactions with fibers or whatever for example for cloth what are your things so your thoughts on that well i mean first of all i think what you just described is for sure going to happen i don't think i don't see it anytime soon that like a video game will be will be based on a, on a neural render in the immediate future I think what we're going to see is we're going to have some effects that we're just going to have with a neural network. Um, and we have that already to some degree if you're looking at anti-aliasing, possibly super resolution. Uh, these kind of things you can do with kind of a, I think NVIDIA pitched this as a machine learning shader or something like this, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of thing I will see, I can see totally happening very soon, right? I can see basically shaders that are nothing else but neural networks that are overfitted to some scene that encode the local lighting and so on or the global elimination of a scene. And then you can kind of simulate global elimination with a neural post-processing afterwards, after you render it. Like this deferred neural rendering is very easy to be combinable with a, a standard renderer. And I think that's definitely going to happen. I don't think in any in any graphics application right now, you can afford to get rid of the full control of the 3D environment. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. So I would, um, like, let me rephrase it. Like, as a renderer, I would not be afraid of losing the job. I think this creates a lot of new opportunities, in fact, um, how you can combine these ideas with traditional rendering. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Again, Julio, feel free to chime in if there are questions from YouTube. Students from the master, anybody? Can, can I ask you about Synthesia, the startup, or? Or is that our territory? How, how is it working? Because we've all actually, it's, I've shown the uh, David Beckham video today in one of my classes, completely unre unrelated topic, but anyway. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but uh, how, how is it going? Um, are, are you moving, are you targeting this reenactment of speech or are you expanding towards other applications based on, on the, uh, so yeah. I think, first of all, I think it's going great. I mean, we have a really fantastic team. Um, I think, I, I mean, I couldn't have hoped for anything better what worked with a startup. So I'm, I'm very excited about it. Um, it's not a, it's not only reenactment what we're doing right now. It's more or less like the text to video avatars is kind of the main focus right. at the moment. Um, so like we do a lot of stuff on e-learning, on corporate communication and stuff like that. So you basically, um, you have a CEO that wants to deliver a message to 30 different languages at the same time of himself, right? So he has his video avatar and then he just types the text in and then this is generated into all the languages at the same time. Same for e-learning when you have like, um, let's say you wanna do a virtual lecture, right? Um, you wanna have your lecture appear in like 30 languages at the same time. Um, you don't even have to do the lecture anymore. You just type the text in and you have your TAs fix the text for you and then you can automatically generate the content for it. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, I'm thinking about it more of a, um, of a question of how do you make content creation easier, right? How do you create your virtual assistant, your virtual avatar very efficiently, right? Um, I'm seeing it also like in the future, you could see stuff like, we're not mm -hmm. quite there yet, but of course that's very interesting to us is um, like replacing a voice, a, voice, a voice call with a video call now. Like, you know, you, you have customer support and these kind of things that so you have the video for it. Um, so yeah, for the for the Malaria Must Die campaign you just posted, for that one we did actually pure reenactment at this point, right? We had actors for it, um, and we trans. So the whole video is actually synthetic, right? This is completely rendered, um, but it, we can we can do much more right now, and the quality also got even a little bit better. Um, basically higher resolution that we, you know, you can upload, you can go to the platform right now, you can sign up for it, um, and you can just type in text, and then you get your video automatically delivered. So one thing I want to do, for instance, for next semester. If we have to still do online teaching, I want to create um, my, my deep learning lecture with deep learning basic. And I think that's going to be pretty cool. That will be very cool. Uh, thank you. So you guys check the video and check out the website of Synthesia. And I, uh, we were chatting before the talk and, and <clears throat> Matthias is looking for, for interested and an interesting student. So now is your time to maybe reach out to him after the talk. 
Okay, do we have any other questions or any other things? Uh, not on YouTube. So. Okay, so if that's all we need, we thank you again, Matthias, and consider this a virtual applause from everybody. Honored to have you as one of our speakers in the in this masters. We ho hopefully we'll be in touch. Um, and yeah, thank you again. Congratulations on all the great work that you are doing. Thank you very much. Th thanks a lot for having me. I think it was was great chatting. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Matthias. I guess I'm just gonna leave, right? <laughs> I guess so. Yes. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah.